the, the main part of the talk will be about pointing, the last bit of the title. And you see some examples here of, well, extended index finger. So the adults presumably know what they're doing, although it doesn't really look that way. It looks like it's a staged photograph. It wasn't, actually. This was taken before I got interested in pointing. They're on the top of a mountain looking at a map, pointing off in different directions. Maybe <laughs> not sure which way to go or where <laughs> lost, perhaps. Um, the baby here has also has an extended <coughs> index finger. So is she pointing socially? Is she conveying meaning? Well, you need to know a little bit about this. She, uh, she's a daughter of a graduate student. And so her mother set her up like this, and she looked so cute. So we got, she got her camera out whenever she got the mother got her camera out, she, Samantha, sort of reached towards the camera like this. And so it's not really clear that it's a, a social gesture. Okay, so I'm going to get to pointing. And why am I interested in pointing? Um, I'm a developmental psychologist. So I'm, I'm interested, in, I've done other sorts of work like moral development, development of social understanding, cognitive development. Here I'm interested in social development in infancy and how communication develops. So that means we need to think about meaning. And when you look at language, it's just so incredibly complex, it's hard to think about, well, how do, how do words actually <coughs> work to convey meaning? We never really think about that. We just use words. We're just embedded in language. But with gestures, with babies, you can actually look at how they're starting to put it together. So I'm interested in babies <coughs> and meaning. And then these other words, information, knowledge, and meaning, they're all related. And in discussions with some of you, it seems like these words come up. And you use this word, information, information visualization. OK, so that's why this title is so long. Um, and so first, I'm going to try and argue that developmental psychology is relevant for what you do, information visualization. So um, well, what? <laughs> This is the way I understand information visualization. Presenting information in ways that facilitate thinking. So perhaps through ref allowing <coughs> reflection on patterns in, in the information you present. So then if, you, if that's an adequate way of characterizing it, it's based on uh, an implicit, at least an implicit account of human thinking. What's it like? How does it work? Because you think that you can facilitate it, you can support it externally. Okay, so I think it's worthwhile um, taking a look at those assumptions that you're starting with, examining them. What kind of a model of thinking are you assuming? So that's why developmental psychology and cognitive science may be relevant for you. Um, so, do kids do this? Do they? Do they do something like information visualization? I'm going to give a little example that maybe will work. Uh, so when my, I've mentioned this to some of you, when my son was about four, he did a lot of counting. At one point he asked me to make seven. And then I realized he wanted me to do this. Because he wanted to count seven plus seven. He didn't have enough fingers himself. So he needed this external support. Later on, in a, some weeks, he could do that in his head. Okay, so this is an example of developmental psychology of sort of supporting that thinking externally until he could master it and do it, as he said, in his head, internally. Um, with what you're doing, it's if, if people have to deal with a lot of complex information, it may still need to be done external. OK, so if what you're doing is based on theories of thinking, then let's take a look at those. I'm going to group them into two families. There are lots of differences among the families, but I think uh, it makes sense to group them into families. So information processing is one, and I'm going to go through some problems with that approach. And I'm going to argue that a constructivist, action-based, or social cultural approach to thinking actually fits better with what you're doing. And according to this view, there's an interactive and social origin for many forms of human thinking. So Lev Vygotsky is one of the important theorists in this area, a Russian, died in 1934. This is a quote from him. He, he talked about tools for thinking, and here are some examples, systems for counting, pneumatic techniques, algebraic symbol systems, works of art, writing, diagrams. The, the tool that he focused on was language. So that's kind of out of your area of visual uh, um, 
visualizations, but he did talk about diagrams. Um, so these are all social products, they're cultural products, that means they, the individual didn't necessarily come up with them, they're produced in a culture, and then they're mastered by the individual and used as a tool for thinking. Another one could be a map. Once you have the concept of a map, you can think about terrain and how to get around in different ways. So um, there's also, I could also talk about social origin of thinking and the role of relationships. Um, those are less central to this talk. But those all follow from this way of thinking, uh, social, cultural, or action-based approach. OK, so first let's take a look at information processing and these terms, information, knowledge, and understanding. They all have different meanings, multiple meanings, depending on the framework or the worldview that you're starting from. So information, um, in the information processing approach, uh, it actually has two meanings. It could mean, well, energy transformation um, or stored information, like in a dictionary, uh, train schedule, tree rings, light. Uh, with a train schedule, for example, there could be lots of information there, um, lots of information in a train schedule in Paris, but not much help to me unless I can decipher it, unless I I have uh, Samuel there to help me figure out exactly what it means. So uh, the, the, the point I'm trying to make here is there's two meanings. One as sort of stored information, the other is knowledge. Okay, so think about a camera. A camera could record information, but the camera doesn't know anything. We can see something, we know something. Okay, we have to get from the first to the second. So that's the problem for developmental psychologists, is how do you explain knowledge? How do we acquire knowledge of the world? From the information processing framework, the two meanings are conflated, collapsed, and so that problem is not, becomes invisible. Okay, but I think that is the real problem we have to deal with. Okay, so then knowledge. What do we mean by knowledge? And I've talked to some of you about that. Again, there are two views of knowledge depending on which framework you take. So um, from the representational theory of knowledge perspective, knowledge is thought of as perception. Well, there's no problem with knowledge. We just look at the world and we know things, okay? Um, and then we form a mental representation of it. So this term mental representation is used a lot in cognitive psychology. And no one really defines it or is very clear about what it actually means. Jim Russell has called it a Humpty Dumpty word because it can be used to mean anything, really, or multiple different things. Humpty Dumpty in The Looking Glass, talking to Alice, said that he could use a word to mean anything he wanted. He just had to pay it more on Saturday night. Um, and so mental representation, well, what does it, how does it work? Presumably we, we see something, information comes in, but then what? How do, how, do we, how do we understand it? How do we think about it? So from this perspective, we're really taking our biggest problem and taking it as a premise. The question is, well, how do we do that? How do we represent things? Because we can, we can think about things that are not there right in front of us. And through, through infancy, babies are learning how to do that. They come to think about objects as external to themselves, and they don't just disappear when they, when they can't see them. Okay, so how does that happen? Well, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to review some criticisms of the idea of knowledge as representation. Okay, so uh, Piaget called this a copy theory, that the, the idea is we see the world and we form a copy of it. So we make a copy. The problem is that sort of presupposes knowledge. It presupposes what it's meant to explain, because how do we form this copy? We must have some knowledge in order to form the, the copy. How do we check for its accuracy? How do we know that this copy, this representation we form, is actually accurate? Um, you have to, a system has to be able to detect error in order to learn something. Okay, but how do we check whether it's right or wrong? So Wittgenstein makes a joke about this. He says, uh, you know, if we buy a copy of the newspaper, 
and we read a story, we think, no, that can't be right. Well, do we go out and buy another copy of the newspaper and read it again? No, that doesn't make sense. We've got to, we've got to have some other way of getting at it. Okay. Um, so the copy theory requires a homunculus. You have to have someone uh, making sense of it, interpreting it, and it presupposes what it's meant to explain. Um, okay, so you might say, well, but this seems to make sense. We have this sort of causal connection to the world. And doesn't that account for knowledge? Uh, problem is the camera also has a causal connection with the world, but it doesn't know anything. Uh, so Joseph Perner is one example of someone who talks about the importance of this causal connection. Hilary Putnam has this uh, science fiction story to sort of point out problems with that. So imagine that you see a tree, so you've got a causal connection, you've got knowledge of a tree, so now you take a picture of that tree. Um, so Hilary Putnam says, you, imagine you drop that picture of a tree, tree on a planet that's just like ours, but there is nothing, there's no trees, nothing bigger than a bush. Someone picks up the picture, looks at it, has the same mental representation as, as someone else. There's a causal connection, but they still don't know anything about a tree because they don't know about trees. And then he says, imagine that you break the causal connection. The, the picture that's dropped is just an accident with spilled paint. It, there was no causal connection with a real tree. You've got the mental representation, but no knowledge of it. OK, so these are all problems, sort of well-known problems with this idea of knowledge as representation. So knowledge is just perception. Um, I'll skip the one from Bickard about encoding. I can talk about that to other people if they want. Uh, so. Well, does this mean we don't have any knowledge? We do have knowledge of the world, obviously. We can walk around, I can, I can navigate the world without walking into walls, so how do we know things? Well, uh, that leads to a constructivistic view of knowledge, or from Piaget, from pragmatists, uh, where we know the world through what we can do with it. So we learn the interactive potential with, of the world, what we can do with it. We develop anticipations of what will happen if we do things with different aspects of the world. Okay, and so from this perspective, we, we represent the world based on our experience with the world. Okay, so this is sensory motor knowledge. This is very early knowledge of the world. When I was talking to you, uh, some of you about knowledge, and I defined it this way, this is one form of knowledge. From this perspective, you have different forms of knowledge that you can uh, you build from this practical knowledge to reflective knowledge. Okay, so this is, um, I mentioned neuroscience there because there's some work in neuroscience that fits with this, that we, it, well, neuroscience really depends on what kind of psychological theory is assumed. Um, some people sort of assume the perception processing output. Other people argue that we perceive in terms of action plans, what we can do with the world. Okay, so there's, there's a whole stream of work in neuroscience that fits with this. So that's, I focused on knowledge of physical world, but the same thing applies to the social world. So we learn to anticipate, babies learn to anticipate how others will respond to their action. So that's the meaning their action has for others. So here's how a view of knowledge is linked to a view of meaning. Okay, and so that's what I'm gonna focus on for this talk. Um, and I'm going to refer to philosophers, but I'm going to use babies to illustrate this because I'm a developmental psychologist, not a philosopher, and babies are doing this. They're learning how to convey meaning so we can watch them and see how are they doing it. How are they mastering this social skill? Now, I also want to link it to visualization because that's what you do, so you know why, why am I talking to you? Well, because if visualizations are tools uh, to be used by individuals, the, they've got to be meaningfully linked to the world somehow. And if they're used to communicate, or if you want other people to understand them, then you're into this issue of meaning. So meaning must be important for you, I think. Okay, so I want to talk about meaning 
um, two views of meaning. Again, I'm going to criticize one and suggest another one as a better alternative, and um, and then use gestures to illustrate it. Okay, so I'll uh, start with a question that uh, my daughter was three and a half, and she said, "Daddy, what is meaning?" Um, I didn't have a good answer for her at that point. I think now I do have a better answer. Um, but interestingly, it's rarely asked by psychologists. Why not? Well, um, it, our theories are based on assumptions about meaning, but we rarely actually think about it. Okay, uh, there, it's just sort of presupposed. This is in, it's it's invisible philosophy. It's not that we can avoid doing philosophy. It's that we've made assumptions, and they're just built in there, we just don't notice them. Okay, so what I want to do is to explicate those, bring out those assumptions, um, because you're going to run into problems, I think, with the wrong view of meaning. So I want to talk about a common view of meaning, what's wrong with it, and I'll give an alternative, and then use gestures as an example. So what is this common view of meaning? Well, Wittgenstein takes it from St. Augustine, from the Confessions, from 1500 years ago, and it's this idea about how human language works. That uh, individual words in language name objects, sentences are combinations of such names. In this picture of language, we find the roots of the following idea. Every word has a meaning. The meaning is correlated with the word. It's the object the word stands for. Okay? So... Let's see how that works. So here is Gary Larson's visualization of that concept. The, the tree, the house, and the caption is now that should clear up a few things around here. Okay, so this, this theory of language, is this really how it works? I mean, he, he's, he's presenting it in a way that he's, he's making fun of it, he's criticizing it, really. Okay, so, well, we don't use language for that. We don't. We can't really imagine a, 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 a culture in which they go around calling out tree, flower, house. We, we do things with language. We don't just... Language is more than labels for things. Okay, so um, here's another example of that view from John Locke. Uh, the idea that, that words have to... Uh, to make words serviceable to the end of communication, it's necessary that they excite in the hearer exactly the same idea that they stand for in the mind. Okay, so this is linked to a view of language. How how does language work? Well, you might think, oh, you know, people don't agree with that anymore. I was reading yesterday morning about a startup company in Silicon Valley that has raised $40 million to uh, proposing an approach to artificial intelligence based on this this kind of an idea, teaching computers the word for table, and they realize, well, you know, kids might learn it after a few times, t computers might n take a million times, but just more and more times. Okay, so that's um, linked to a view of how language works, a code model. We transmit thoughts, the sort of conduit metaphor. We encode our thoughts into words, transmit them, and then decode them. And here's an example from Steven Pinker's book, The Language Instinct, that kind of idea of language. Okay, so that's a common view of meaning. I'm going to go through some problems with it, this idea of words as names for things. So, um, well, again, I have this question from my daughter, who's a bit older now. She said, uh, Daddy, how did people make up the words for things? And I was driving at the time, and I thought I could just keep her happy with a simple theory, and I said, maybe they could point to a tree and say, tree? And she said, but how could they make up important words like could or they? Okay, so, um, but of course psychologists are, psychologists don't like sim simple anecdotes, they like replications. Um, so, uh, well, we had a second child. My wife doesn't think of this as a replication. Uh, <laughs> but when he was about eight, we were talking about various things and, and he said, it would be very hard to develop talk. And I was surprised, but didn't say anything. And then he said, how would they do it? Um, before I could say anything, he said, maybe showing someone something and pointing. No, they wouldn't have developed pointing. Maybe they would take a dead stegosaurus and say stegosaurus. 
or pterodactyl and say pterodactyl. I still didn't have a chance to say anything, and then he said, but how would they develop thank you? How would they develop the word thank you? That would be hard. Okay, so he's already finding problems with this view of language. Um, another interesting point about this transcript is you can sort of see the process of reasoning in this transcript. So that fits with this, he, he's responding to his previous point. So that fits with this social cultural idea that the process of reasoning has this social origin. Um, okay, continuing with problems, this, this is an old view of meaning. It's also been criticized for a long time. There's an example in Jonathan Swift, Gulliver's Travels. At one point, Gulliver is in a town where the scholars have, have figured out that words are just like names for things. And so they figured out they could save their breath by just bringing out things. Instead of you know, saying cup, they could just hold up a cup. Um, and that, you know, that would be healthier because they wouldn't have to use their breath. They could save their breath. It did mean they have to carry around big bags of things. Um, and if they wanted to have a really broad conversation, the bag had to be bigger and so helped if you could afford a servant or two. Um, and he says that the, the women in the town didn't, didn't uh, want to get involved in it. Um, okay, so there's just lots and lots of examples of how words can have more than one meaning. Sarcasm, irony. Uh, so when Max was 12 months, uh, I said, thanks, Max. And my daughter said, why do you say thanks to Max? He just, I was holding him, 12 months old. He just wiped his nose on my sweater. And I said, thanks, Max. So sarcasm, irony. Lots of examples from pragmatics. Here's one from uh, Calvin and Hobbes. Calvin's hammering nails into the coffee table. His mother runs in and says, Calvin, what are you doing to the coffee table? He looks at it, sort of perplexed. It seems fairly clear what he's doing to the coffee table. And he says, is that some sort of trick question? Okay, so clearly she means something different. Okay, so these are just more and more examples of how words, utterances, any kind of representation doesn't have a fixed meaning. Gary Larson again. Um, she's a butte norm. What is she? A 24 footer. And then in the next one, she's a butte norm. Uh, what is she? Uh, a butte Ernie. What is she? A 24 footer. Okay, we're, so here they're referring to different things. This is an aspect of language called indexicality. Okay, so of course, philosophers and theorists interested in language are well aware of this. Um, Chomsky and Fodor, they use examples like, the famous one is avoid boring professors. This could have two meanings, avoid professors who are boring or avoid getting professors bored. So if you want to preserve this mechanistic idea of meaning, how do you save it? Well, you say that, okay, on the surface, there could be two meanings, but underneath, um, it's got to be linked to two separate meanings. Well, it seems to, to work for, for these sorts of examples, but I can show you lots and lots of examples where there's just multiple meanings, more than two. Okay, back to Gary Larson again. Here, there's a pilot of an aircraft uh, looking at someone stranded on a desert island right, writing something on the beach, and the pilot says, wait, wait, cancel that. I guess it says health. He had thought it said help. Okay, so here Gary Larson is again criticizing this view of meaning, um, but it also kind of hints at an alternative view of meaning. That is, it, that this is funny because it's just so obvious from, based on the social situation, shared understanding, what it means, what he's trying to convey. Okay, that's why it's funny. So, so, so this is perhaps a better view of meaning based on the shared social experience. Okay, um, some more examples of multiple meaning. Now if we move away from words, what about pauses? This is an example of my, from my colleague Bill Turnbull, an exchange between a husband and a wife, and A says, I'm getting fat. And now there's a three second pause attributed to, to B. Three seconds is a long time in a conversation. And A says, do you really think so? It's taken as yes. Okay, don't try this at home. 
Um, so do pauses mean yes? Here's another example. This is overheard in an art gallery. C says, I really like that. Again, three second pause, D. And then C sort of retracts it and says, well, I mean, I think it's the type of work that kind of grows on you. Okay, their pause seems to mean disagreement. Well, how does it work? I mean, it, do it doesn't work with this idea that meaning is attached to something. It depends, depends on the shared situation. Okay, so all of these are sort of to get you warmed up for Wittgenstein's critique of that view of meaning. Um, so Ludwig Wittgenstein's an important philosopher. When I talk to psychologists, I usually say something about his background. Um, I've been talking to some of you, and people have very diverse backgrounds here, it seems, so maybe some of you know a bit about Wittgenstein. Um, he grew up in Vienna in this palatial, he, he was in a family, one of the richest families in, in Europe at the time, grew up in a palatial home with seven grand pianos, his brothers were musical geniuses. He was considered the slow one in the family, and so he was sent to study engineering, but then he got into philosophy, uh, studied with Bertrand Russell. Bertrand Russell stopped doing philosophy after working with Wittgenstein. Um, Wittgenstein published one book in philosophy when, during his lifetime, and in that book he had solved all the problems of philosophy, and then he went to teach in the poorest village in, in uh, Austria that he could find, and then he gradually realized maybe he hadn't quite solved those problems. So it's his second Wittgenstein that is, he's reacting to his first work that is really important here for the for a view of meaning. So he says, well, with this view of language, well, would it work for a primitive language? Could we imagine a primitive language based on that view of meaning as attached to words? So he thinks, well, builder, you have a builder and a helper, and you have words like slab, block, pillar, and you have numbers like one, two, three, four, five. Very, very simple, should work, it seems. Um, you could have an utterance like five slabs, <coughs> but what does it mean? Well, it could be an order. The builder might be ordering five slabs. It could be a report. There's five slabs left. could mean that they were, it's going to take more five slabs to finish it. It <coughs> depends. Um, so even that simple utterance doesn't have fixed meaning. Okay, so I've mentioned uh, Bill Turnbull. He always, a colleague, he always says, well, you shouldn't go with these made-up examples. You re need real examples. So I'll give you a real example. I was at home one day reading Wittgenstein, as one does, and my wife came home from shopping, and she said, I have five bags in the car. So I wondered, what did she mean? <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I give this example, all the women in the audience know immediately what she meant, of course go and get the bags. Um, so so the, the point from Wittgenstein, the moral of the story from Wittgenstein, is that meaning can't be attached to a representation. Okay, so here's a quote from Wittgenstein. Imagine a picture of a boxer in a particular fighting stance. So this picture could be used to tell someone many different things. Is this the right way to stand? The wrong way to stand? or a particular man stood in this way, multiple different meanings. Okay, so, so <clears throat> hopefully I've given you enough reasons to question that theory of meaning, which means that we now need an alternative view of meaning. Okay, because clearly we do convey meaning somehow. How does it work then? So, for an alternative view of meaning, um, you might think, can we go to Wittgenstein? Well, I've, for the last 10 years, been getting into trouble from saying something positive after mentioning Wittgenstein, and saying Wittgensteinian scholars say, no, you can't say anything positive, it seems uh, that's illegal. Uh, although there are Wittgensteinians who do agree with me, but I can go to, uh, for now, go to George Herbert Mead, a philosopher who was writing s decades before Wittgenstein for a, a view of meaning. And philosophers really have been talking about meaning for the last hundred years. 
So he says, well, much subtlety has been wasted on the problem of meaning. It's not necessary in attempting to solve this problem to have recourse to psychical states, for the nature of meaning is found. So that's Mead's point. Awareness or consciousness <clears throat> is not necessary for meaning in the, it's, it's already there in social experience. And so the mechanism of meaning is present in the social act before the emergence of consciousness or awareness of meaning occurs. And we can see this in animal communication systems, ants, bees. There's lots of complex communication going on. They don't have to be aware that they are conveying meaning the way humans are aware. Okay, so um, it's this transition that's really interesting and really important. That's why I'm interested in infant development and how they become aware that their gestures have meaning. Okay, so the child learns how others respond. They can, they can anticipate, they can understand. Um, so that means we have transitions in evolution across species and also in development, in child development. Okay, and so now I want to move to some more examples from uh, developmental psychology to kind of fill this in, to illustrate this process. And I'll use pointing. Pointing is being of interest to developmental psychologists. I'll, some people have called it the simplest act. I think it's really, once you start to look at it, it's far from simple. This um, hand gesture can be used to convey lots of different meanings. Um, it seems pretty essential. It, it does differ cross-culturally. So in some cultures, it's rude to point, and there are other ways to point, like lip pointing. For example, it, it, it's before words, but it seems to be based on the same process of meaning that language is based on. And then I'll, I'll get to words at the end. So um, I've been approaching this with a, a different sort of method that I've been using the last few years, diary studies. Uh, there is experimental work on pointing, but most of it's done with kids who already point and so then you can't really look at how does it develop right how are babies learning to do this um, here I want to point out that the the theory and methods are kind of related because if you think that babies are kind of learning how their action has meaning for others then it's going to depend on the dyad a little bit. And different gestures could emerge in different dyads. So for, for example, my son learned a gesture that was something like this, which meant swimming. And so you don't necessarily see that in, in all babies, but it, it, it emerged for him. Okay, so I asked parents to, uh, to record observations of their, their child using an extended index finger and um, other examples of communication. Um, and I'll give you some examples here. This is my first research participant. And so I started with one and then um, included other families and his mother was particularly brilliant at recording observations. Um, and I had told her that I was interested in this transition from um, from a natural reaction, like leaning and reaching, to the child becoming aware of it. Okay, and so, as I said before, the, these natural reactions can have meaning for the parent, and the child becomes aware of it. So, for example, if he saw something he liked on his mother's plate, he might sort of lean towards it with an open mouth, like, like that. Okay, so it's pretty clear what it means. And even if he did it with a stranger, they knew what he meant. Um, if I did that when we went over to get lunch, um, would they understand? Probably, but I, it would probably not really be acceptable, except for uh, perhaps if I <laughs> pretended I didn't, I didn't have it share enough language. Um, but <clears throat> okay, so so really, the meaning is there in that action. Why? Because it is based on this shared understanding. Okay, so mean, meaning is, is, is based on these shared routines. For example, going for a walk. That's a common thing that, that many people do in our culture. 
Um, and so this little baby had learned about that. Go to the door, put your shoes on, go outside. And so then he could go to the door, kind of vocalize, hold his foot by the shoe, and then his dad would realize he wants to go for a walk, go over and put his shoes on, go out for a walk. Okay, so meaning is being conveyed, communication is working, fine, based on these shared routines. Okay, walking along, holding hands. Um, it's, again, it's just based on the shared routines. It's like if I, I've been enjoying walking around Paris trying to communicate with my little tiny bit of French, and well, I can manage to buy things at a, a bakery, um, I can point to things, um, and people understand me, partly because of the routine. We know about buying things, we know about eating. These are things we do together as humans. Okay, so how does this work for pointing then? Pointing as a gesture in particular. Okay, well, um, pointing can, can serve lots of different functions. Some of the classic ones are to make a request, like get me that, or to point to direct attention, like look at that. Um, there lots of, it can be used in lots of other ways as well, to inform, to ask questions. Okay, but how do we, <sighs> How do we get from this extended index finger to a meaningful point? So you see the baby there in the middle, extended index finger, but at five months, she's not really conveying meaning, okay? Um, it seems that the human hand is sort of configured this way, that the index finger is well suited for, for touching, maybe for the pincher grip. Um, you see this hand configuration in, in young infants before they use it communicatively. Okay, she's sort of, it, it's, it's sort of tempting to attribute meaning to that as adults because we, we, we think of it as meaningful. Okay, so um, from the perspective that I'm taking, they, the idea is that they learn how others respond to that. Okay, and a number of other theorists uh, there's a long tradition of this way of thinking. So I'll give you some examples of diary observations. At six months, three weeks, this baby was, his mother observed this pointing hand configuration while he was asleep. Okay, so clearly he's not communicating. At seven months, he's using the, his finger to touch and to explore things, to touch dots on the sheet, to touch uh, his mother's freckles, try and pick them up. At nine months, she, she saw him pointing while he was lying in bed. She came into the room and he was lying in bed pointing up at the ceiling. So clearly, there was no one else there. It was not social at that point. Okay, so then um, he's using his index finger to explore things that are close by, then things that are further away. Um, in an elevator, he would look over at the elevator wall and then extend his index finger, walk over and touch it. Okay, so um, then he gradually learns how to expect a response from the action. Then the action becomes social. Okay, so, so the pointing is first touching to explore, sometimes in the context of book reading. Um, second picture there, he is actually in Paris when he's 11 months, touching something on the ground and then gradually it becomes social. Okay, um, so we followed this up with um, 12 other families. They followed the same pattern uh, except for one and that may be due to the uh, mother not um, recording enough observations. Um, when I talk about this, people usually, usually ask about imitation. Is this based on imitation? So two of the infants also imitated pointing as well as touching with their index finger. So imitation may play some role and imitation would certainly play a role with gestures like um, waving. Waving like waving is a cultural gesture and so then they have to imitate it. But they still have to learn what it means, how to use it socially. Um, and so with the example of imitating, one of the babies had two older sisters. They were pointing, and mother and father were sitting around the table, and then he started pointing, everyone laughed. So they got, he got a response, then he started doing it, but it's 
it's meaningless at that point. It's not, he's not using it to convey meaning. Okay, um, I'll give you an example of uh, some, a, a sequence, because really you, you need to see the sequence here. So he first points, and then the mother is intentionally slow in responding, and then he tries all sorts of follow-up responses to try, and, to try and get her to do it. He moves her hand and tries to get her to actually do it. Okay, so this shows that he is trying to, uh, he is trying to communicate, he is trying to get something there, get something happening. Um, in some of the earlier observations of pointing, they may just point, but without expecting a response. Okay, by this, at this time in development, he, he has learned that um, he should be getting some action here. Okay, so now how, how does pointing develop? I've described one possibility there. Um, there is another possibility proposed by Michael Tomasello more recently. And he argues that um, when they start pointing, infants already understand others as intentional agents whose attention can be directed. Okay, so for him, there's an insight. This is an alternative view of how pointing develops based on some insight about others as intentional agents. And then pointing starts off communicatively. Um, I haven't gone into so much detail for, on his theory, I would do that for a different sort for developmental psychologists. For you, I think it's the idea of meaning that is important here. How does meaning work? And it seems that the, these diary observations support the idea that it is based on these shared routines. Um, okay, so the other interesting and Another interesting thing about diary observations is you get observations that are sort of unexpected or don't fit with theories. Like this observation that his mother, the mother of this infant, AJ, called uh, his Uncle Sam wants you point, where the baby would point directly at her, look at her, and point at her. And so that really we don't really do that as adults. That doesn't really serve a social function. Well, you could imagine some, possibly. Um, but that's an observation that doesn't fit some theories. Uh, but um, you, you find these interesting observations in di with the diary approach. OK, so I want to talk about the approach that I take, a relational approach. Um, that our constructivist approach, according to which um, communication sort of gradually emerges from, from interaction. And so uh, you have to think about the, the characteristics of the baby and the characteristics of the mother and how, they, how uh, interaction gets going. So this is a, a quote from a, well, this is a a quote from a, a poem by Erasmus Darwin, who's writing about different species, and he says, proud man alone in wailing weakness born. So one thing about human infants is they tend to be, well, they are helpless. And so this ensures a, a social environment. They grow up in a social environment. And so they, they learn how their social envir environment responds to them, just as they learn about their physical environment. And so then they can gradually learn these, acquire these social skills and learn how to communicate, learn how to make requests. We can contrast that with other species like chimpanzees. They don't seem to point in the wild, but they do in captivity. So why don't they point in the wild? Well, they don't need to. They can just go and get things because they're not as helpless as, as human infants. In captivity, when they've been cared for by, by humans, if they can't get outside of their cage, they learn how to point outside of their cage for a, a caregiver. Okay. Um, so I want to make a distinction here that might be useful for, the, for learning visualizations. 
um, I want to talk about two types of gestures. There's some gestures that are based on natural reactions, like reaching, the arms up gesture, grasping. Uh, some babies learn how to, how to uh, make a request by doing this based on a grasping action. That seems to be based on a natural reaction. Pointing, perhaps, is learned the same way. Then there's other gestures that are conventional, like waving or clapping, that must be based on their cultural, it must be based on imitation. Some gestures are more controversial in between, like head nodding and shaking for yes and no. These are actually quite complex gestures. Um, they're more controversial. Um, <clears throat> okay, so then on top of that, we have to get the language from gestures. How, do langu how does language work? How do words work? From this approach, words are sort of added on to these routines. Like once a child can do pointing, then they could add look and see. Once a child can make a request like this, then they could learn a word like want. Okay, um, because of the time, I'm gonna have to skip over another kind of massive area like word learning. Uh, but the general idea is it still has to be meaning has to be based on these shared routines. Okay, so I'm going to just draw some conclusions for developmental psychology and then for information vis visualization. So this kind of approach is sort of a natural history approach, describing how communication comes together, emerges in interaction, and then language is based on that, and then thinking and mind is based on that. If this approach is correct, it makes sense, then it rules out claims that thinking could be innate or hardwired. And so that, that's an issue that uh, developmental psychologists, cognitive scientists are concerned about. Some, some people argue that thinking could be, uh, babies could be born this way. Well, if this approach is right, then they couldn't be born this way because meaning has to be based on, on social relations. Okay, so, um, I want to think about some conclusions for information visualization. I, I, from my perspective, I think that you do assume a view of knowledge and meaning, and I've reviewed different ones and suggested that an action-based constructivist approach is best suited for you, especially a social-cultural approach to human thinking. And this includes the idea that human thinking is more complex forms of thinking are based on reflection and I think that's, that's one way to think about what information visualization is doing. It's, it's support for thinking and allowing reflection. So it allows, us, allows people to externalize and then to reflect. And it also, this, this approach fits with the idea of support for thinking or scaffolding. Okay, so then some final thoughts about this. And then you can tell me that it's totally wrong or it's not useful, but we'll see. Um, so I've, I've made a distinction with gestures between those that are based, uh, those that are conventional and those that are based on natural reactions. What I mean by natural reactions is they emerge in a typical human way of life. Like babies being helpless, reaching towards something is a natural reaction. So what about visualizations. Well, you can have an alphabet that is fairly abstract. You can contrast that with the kanji symbol for person that I have here, which is represents one person being supported by another. So this includes a concept of a person, a way of thinking about a person. Um, and it's also kind of based on some shared understanding about, about people. So that may be sort of somewhere in, in between. Pantomime um, is based on resemblance. So, so there may be some visualizations that are based more on typical human experience, natural reactions, and some that are more conventional. And I don't think this is an absolute distinction, more like a, a continuum. Okay, and I should, I should end it there and uh, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. We can take questions if you'd like.
Yeah. Um, I hope that I can uh, voice my question appropriately because I don't. I, I'm not entirely sure myself really about the question. So we are doing uh, work here on interaction with virtualization. Sheila is doing that as well, in particular on uh, types of and in that kind of context, we are often talking about gestural interaction. So and one observation that I have is that people are not necessarily clear about what they mean with gestures in that context of interaction with data. Not clear because um, it seems at least intuitively, and from what I heard uh, you talk about just now, Gestures are often uh, in the natural world when, when we talk to each other as, as humans, um, are often patterns, uh, actions with our arms, for example, or limbs, or head even, um, that are sort of patterns conveying abstract meanings. Uh, in the context of uh, interaction with visualization, however, we often uh, want to manipulate specific elements of visualization. And there we also use our motions with fingers, for example, on the surface or in 3D space in order to make manipulations. Now, I looked at uh, a number of uh, interactive visualizations that use this kind of gestural interaction. It seems that many of them uh, do not use this kind of pattern, abstract meaning, uh, form of gestures, but more gestures that have, that basically identify immediately what is meant uh, by the gesture and then use the motion to introduce manipulations. So maybe my question is, in the, in the physical world, when we interact, when we speak to each other, when we uh, have social interactions, uh, are, is there that kind of distinction as well? Um, do we also see these different types of gestures? Um, is one more common than the other? Is it maybe a continuum? Just curious about this. Um, if I understand you, I, I think there's two totally different things that we're talking about here. Okay. Like because if you're talking if you're talking about using gestures to communicate to to operate a machine, is that what you? Are well, in a about? way, the gestures are language to tell the system what I want to do. How I want, I, I'm communicating with the interactive system, just as I'm communicating with other people. Um, but isn't that a, a language in a totally different sense? Because you can have a formal language or a natural language. And if, if you are operating the machine, you could, you could be using a steering wheel to operate a car, but you could just have a virtual wheel there and say, oh, I'm just doing a gesture. Mm -hmm. But it's the same thing. You're not really communicating in the way we communicate between people. So that there's a very different use of the word language there. Well, maybe that's one of the problems that this term gesture is so ambiguous that we can that we use it for different things. Yeah. And I mean, the, the gestural interaction in the you're welcome to to agree or disagree with that. But the the, the term gesture is often used in this communication with the machine as well. And it is derived or based on the understanding of gestures and how we communicate to, to each other. So I'm just trying to learn what what the relationship between the different worlds are and uh, if I can learn maybe from how we use gesture in, in natural language communication. Yeah. So, yeah, so like I said, I think these are two uses of the word language. And in uh, for the for communicating for operating a machine, this fixed idea of meaning works fine. Right? Because well, something. The thing is also that uh, I, I wouldn't necessarily see this interaction with a visualization system or any kind of computer system uh, necessarily only as a fixed language, hmm. because ultimately we want to be able to we want to facilitate interaction in a way that I don't have to learn this fixed. Uh, not never changing language, but we want to have an, an easy way of getting access to to the data or the information that we that we're looking for. 
So to make it do things. To make it do things, to make it show us things, to <coughs> learn something about the, the data, for example. So, and, and, and people always talk about this natural interaction, but they don't really know what this concept means. And it, it, I think one aspect of it is that the language doesn't have to be fixed, it can change. There can be multiple ways, multiple ways to achieve the same work, same thing. And maybe there's also a potential for ambiguity in the, in the interaction and in the language that I'm using. But the, the interactive system, if, if you're gonna use the word communicate, um, the interactive system doesn't need to know that you are intending to communicate. No. It's, it's not the way humans communicate. I mean, if you think about social insects like ants and bees, well, one does something and then the other responds. Mm -hmm. um, they don't need to understand that they are trying to communicate. They don't need to understand the significance of their action for the other. So the, if you're using the word communication between a human and a system, interactive system, it's something quite different. I mean, as I said, I, I'm not entirely clear about the question myself. <laughs> and it's just uh, because no, it, I mean, pointing it, is so, so essential in, in touch interaction. I, I'm just wondering about the, the use of uh, gestural interaction and natural language communication and uh, how that relates or what we can learn from that for building our interactive systems. Yeah, I don't know. I, mean, I think we have the same kind of problem when people try to make natural language interfaces, that people do whatever they want with gestures, no matter how we might want to prescribe them. So they're not, people, people the people interacting with the system are not really that predictable. Um, and yet the system uh, has just predictable ways of responding. So you get some mismatch that's hard to work with. Well, is that the way I find when, and I do, though, yes, working with functions, she likes to use the word natural, but I actually find it a very uncomfortable word to use. Uh, this natural interaction is not defined at all yet. No. There's a book and about it, and they don't tell me, what they it don't is. tell you what it is. No. Because they don't know what it is. They don't know what it is. No. And I, 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 I mean, I'm not sure that it can be. And that's why this concept should be criticized, because it's, it's so fuzzy. Uh, we should probably talk Crit about it in a different way. We should understand yeah. what we really want to do. I, I th yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I have a kind of yeah, story about people trying to make a natural language interface and how it just failed so completely miserably. And I think, well, we're trying to step in some kind of middle ground with gestures and have something that feels more comfortable, um, and uh, yet yeah, it's not going to ever be a natural language. You know, so that we're trying to go towards some kind of ease. Um, that's, anyway, I, 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 I should Yes, like if I'm trying to communicate uh, to, to buy a, a croissant at the bakery, um, well, is it that, that this gesture has fixed meaning? Um, if I was communicating, interacting with a machine, then, then yes, you'd have to have fixed meaning for a particular kind of gesture. But, but this pointing gesture in the context of a bakery, would, if I point to a croissant, then I'm probably requesting one probably conveys a request in that context. But in other contexts could mean something totally different. So I'm a comment slash question. It might turn into a question. <laughs> but um, this makes me, this whole thing um, about you said on um, text and all that, it makes me think of the work in semiotics on the difference between signs and symbols. So signs have a direct relation between the uh, signified and the signifier. Where symbols has an abstract relation that is social, that's based on a social convention, and um, I think in relation to, to this as well. Um, so for for a symbol to work, you need context. You need uh, series, and so in text, typically when you use the word tree, as you said, so you have a picture of a tree. 
but you don't know what the color, well, you don't necessarily know that trees may have different colored leaves, that they may have different co colored barks, that they may. But really, we would, in language, we don't just have, that's kind of back to this naming game idea of language. It's just linked to a tree, the word tree linked to a tree. But we don't do that with language. We do things. We the, the meaning that's already has got to be based on some, some routine, something that we do with language. So I agree. And so this is the sort of symbolic level. Um, as opposed to the sign level. Yes, yes. So what you're talking about is abstracted out of what people actually do. It only works because you can trace it back to interactivity. We get the idea that that system, that abstract system actually works, but it doesn't really. It, it only appears to work because it is we can communicate in particular situations. Because we share a common ground of understanding. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. 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 Uh, in your observations about the transition from the stage where um, the babies were not aware of, of these particular like gestures and of their meaning yeah. to the stage where they were actually aware of them and using them for a particular purpose, was there any phase where there was a sort of like experimentation with this gesture, so I would like try it this way and see what it means. Oh no, it doesn't work, so maybe I will do it like that and it will like convey. Because it seems to me like there is um, there is a stage where both uh, parts agree on the meaning of this particular gesture, and that's when um, like the uh, disagreement happens and the and the, like the purpose is is achieved by the person who's asking, for instance, for pointing. But is there like a stage where <coughs> one of the two parts, or like maybe both of them, are trying to change either what their gestures <coughs> or their understanding of the gestures in order to get to that particular agreement? Yes, yeah, there is. Lots of sort of messy things where it's not quite clear what's going on. So that's why this is interesting. A philosopher like Mead can just spell out the distinctions. And yes, we can, as you said, we can see clear cases where you can see the, you know, the endpoints, but there's a, this gray transitional area. So yeah, you can see there are observations where parent may take it as meaningful, but it's not at all clear that the child does. So one observation where a mother said that, you know, she, she felt, you know, when her baby was doing this. She reacted a certain way when her baby was doing this. She reacted a different way, um, and and then there's there's lots of observations where a, a baby may um, just sort of look out into a room and do this, but is not it's not expecting any response, and you can tell because they're not persisting. So that's why I gave you the example of the video where the baby was persisting. You can see from the sequence of interaction that he had some sort of expectation. But in this process of persistence, then does the baby like change the gesture, or does it, or does Try he do the same thing over and over again? Well, you could see in the in the video he he was trying other things. He first okay. tried to point, then he took her hand and tried to push her hand to get her to go and reach it. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, because that would be like an interesting way of seeing how the system would would try to like interpret what what the user is is doing yeah like if the user tries several things and then how would that change the system's interpretation yeah yeah that's interesting if we if we asked mothers to kind of be slow and and that's what this mother was actually doing she was intentionally being a little bit slow but if we did that, if we brought them in and we asked them to not respond <laughs> or to slow down, uh, then you could see what the baby would try to do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks.